All right, being recorded. Okay, um, so we left off with de-ice, and I'm going to throw in there, that's to get rid of ice. And then the other side of that is anti-ice. Anti-ice, which is the to prevent ice equals prevent ice. So we have remove, de-ice removes it and anti-ice prevents it. This is going to be a big deal to us when we get into propeller and the de-ice of those. So um, ice is most likely to form at part throttle. Part throttle. Part throttle operations. Well, really, there's a there's pretty much two times when we're using part throttle, and I should say um, below below cruise. So we're way down below cruise. So when do we have the the throttle mostly closed? Well, when we're on the ground idling and when we're landing, and those are the times where you are most likely to get ice. If you get ice when you're on the ground idling, that's not the worst thing in the world. When you get ice where you're trying to land and you need to add a little power to make it to the runway, it suddenly becomes the worst thing in the world, so. If you're idling and get ice on the ground, should you just not fly? Oh, no, absolutely fly. Uh, it's not a big deal at all. Um, I was trying to think, I, boy, it's not that common. I, I guess I'm such a fair weather flyer that I don't get it often, but. I remember last time Katie and I were getting ready to fly down to Bakersfield. It was a nice cool morning. It's a great time to fly. We were doing our run up and, and uh, yeah, the thing kept icing up on us. So I just pulled carb heat on and left it on until I was ready to take off Then turn the carb heat off and then take off. And of course, the reason why I want the carb heat off when I take off, because I don't want that hundred degree air. Well, it adds a hundred degrees. So 160 some degree air running through my carburetor because that decreases power, it increases the chance of detonation, there's nothing good about it. So, all right, engine will, what am I gonna say here? Engine will run slightly richer, so if we have, let me just back up just to make sure we're clear here. So, um, so um, I don't wanna do this. Yeah, I'll just go with this. So engine will run slightly richer with carb heat on. About a year ago, I took off from an airport right here by my house. And it's not a, it's a very short runway. And right off the end of the runway is uh, grapes. Uh, there's nowhere to go. And that's a real, not a fun feeling. Um, because you always think about this as a pilot. Okay, what do I do if the engine quits? And you always think that, always think that. You always want to be ready. And uh, so I take off and of course I look out and I'm like, you know, what do I do if the engine quits? I'm going into the grapes and that's going to destroy the aircraft and it's going to hurt me. And right about the end of that thought, the engine suddenly dropped about 150 RPM. I mean, just like that, boom. And boy, let me tell you, that caught my attention right freaking now. And, uh, it was, it was just not a day, I'd been idling and stuff, and I, I knew it wasn't really a, an ice kind of a day, but you know that's, that's the only thing you can really do at that point. It, you, I checked down, you know, all the, the mixtures full rich, the throttles wide open, because I'm right next to the ground taking off. Uh, I had my little daughter Mari with me. And, um, and then I think, well, you know, it could be carb heat, but I really don't want to pull carb heat on while I'm at this high power setting. Uh, cause it was actually a pretty warm day, but, uh, gained a little bit of altitude and then start troubleshooting. And so, uh, pull the carb heat and I got no response. So that right there told me if I can pull the carb heat and it acts exactly the same, then that's what happened to me is the carb heat came on inadvertently. And what had happened is whoever had installed the engine on, on this aircraft and hooked up the controls, they used a three sixteenths inch bolt where a quarter inch should have went. So a bolt that was too small and it was rattling around in this little steel arm and it rattled a hole right through it. And then the pressure of the air popped the valve open and turned on my carb heat and I could not turn it off. So I see turn. So I always turn off 
carb heat on landing because the air is not filtered, which is to say that carb heat is unfiltered. I wrote you. Oh, Kevin. Yeah. So can you fly with a car heat bomb? Uh, like in your case? Probably shouldn't, but I did. Okay. I was on my way back to Sacramento um, from here where the airplane was. And, and so I didn't really want to abort the flight and turn around. So I just gained some altitude near the airport, assessed it, evaluated it. And then you know, diagnosed it as a carb heat was on and I thought, okay, so if I'm just going to fly it at, you know, 65% power, I flew it a little bit, a little bit slower, a little bit less power. I just flew it back. It wasn't terribly hot out that day. If it would have been a 150 degree day or something like it is around here, I probably would have just aborted it and came back because I didn't want to. So, all right. Uh, Wait, Kevin, I thought you said you turned carb heat Wait, on when you're landing. Um, sorry, let me change this upon, upon touchdown. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah, well, that makes way more right sense. when you're on the ground. Yeah. As soon as I get wheels down, carb heat off. All right, let's talk about some repair of carburetor, just some notes, things to think about. So, well, I guess I always have to say this. Always use manufacturers latest overhaul manual, latest overhaul slash repair manual. Um, yep, always have current service bulletins, service letters, and service instructions. And to me, this is something, and I'm just gonna get on my little soapbox, you know, cause I can, cause there's nobody to take my microphone away. So I have my microphone. Uh, this, is, this is what really separates, I think, the really good mechanics from the ones that probably ought not to even be out in the field are the ones that actually care enough to spend the money to get the actual latest overhaul manual. Um, they always have their service bulletins, always have their service instructions, and I should always put, ADs and so you always know your airworthiness directives and you actually take the time to know this most of the problems that I've seen out in the field uh, that get ugly you know it always starts with that that complacency you know the dirty dozen eh, you know I've been working on this thing for I know what it is I don't need that manual so um, all right um, you do you know like what in what type of time frame like are you looking for the latest overhaul manual every year, latest SISPs every month, that type of thing? Okay, so airworthiness directives come out bi-weekly, every other week. And if you have the latest service bulletins, letters, and instructions, that means you have a subscription to them. And so usually in one of the service bulletins, letters, or instructions is in that subscription, they will announce and tell you about which manuals are the most current. But if you don't know, let's, you know, if you're working in a repair station and you're really into this stuff, you just, I don't know how you do, you just know because you're so involved and you're buying products from the manufacturer, you're getting their, their, their um, subscriptions. And so they, they inform you when there's a big major change. Um, a lot of times too, when you buy a manual, you send in a card and it says this manual has is good for one year of updates. And so you send it in and then every time there's a page revision, they'll send you a new page. So you know that you're up to date. Um, if, if you're, let's say you're just working for yourself, you know, and you're not sure and you, it's been two years since you had to actually work on a carburetor, then I would just call up the manufacturer and say, Hey, I'm getting ready to work on a carburetor. And I just want to make sure that I have the latest, uh, manual. It's really, it's really easy to do. Uh, the manual that we're going to be using, I actually just called uh, Facet or Precision, whatever the heck they are right now. And I said, hey, I'm a teacher over to school and I would love to be using the latest and, and, and best stuff. 
but uh, I can't really pay you for a manual. Can you help me out? And they said, absolutely. We're going to send you a manual. It just says like instructional use only across the pages and uh, we'll, we'll send you a brand new manual. So that's, that's why you guys have a new manual that says that across there, which is a little bit of a pain, but you know, at least you have the good stuff. Uh, so you hey, can, Kevin. Yeah. I have a quick question. So okay. um, when you pull the carb heat, you said that because of the hot air, it will richen the mixture, right? Yep. Why don't you just lean it out? Like adjust the mixture so that it doesn't run rough. Well, you really, it doesn't really run rough per se, but let's talk about when you're doing it. So if I were up at say 6,000 feet flying along, it's a really, really cold day or it's, it's an ice, it's very humid. And I am getting ice to the point where I'm constantly turning on the carb heat, constantly turning it off. Then we always have to follow the, uh, the operating manual, but I know a lot of pilots will then pull on their carb heat partially not fully, but partially, and add enough hot air to just keep the ice from coming back. And they will lean at that point to that. But when I'm coming in for a landing, the last thing I want to do is start leaning. I'm already, it's already a cockpit, kind of a busy time. You're watching for traffic, you're descending, and you have to always be prepared for a go around. And one of the worst things that could happen is I could be coming in to flare and something runs out on the runway and I got to do a go around and I have to remember push in the carb heat, push in the mixture, then push in the throttle. It's not going to happen because uh, I fly with one hand on the yoke and one hand on my throttle so that if anything goes wrong, I can instantly take off. So I would have to switch that to one hand on the mixture control. And so, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to lean out then. Plus I don't even know how you would necessarily lean out because you're at idle. So since you're at idle, you're on the idle circuit and um, well, the mixture would work for you, but it's not in a Stromberg, but uh, it just, I think it's over and complicates some things. What, what's the yoke? The steering wheel. The stick, the yoke. Gotcha. Steering wheel. Uh, okay, you can use drill bits. You can use drill bits for something. I don't know. You can use real drill bits um, that have been calibrated, that have been calibrated. to measure holes. And how do you calibrate them? You measure them with a calibrated micrometer. Um, let's see how much I want to do here. I'm going to skip some of this stuff. Um, like drill bits work good for checking marble float levels. Well, of course it does. It says right in the manual, use a drill bit. Um, Check the, you, you check float level on a marvel with the gasket in place. Of course you do, because the manual just tells you to do that. So I'm not going to tell you what the manual says on all these. Um, I'd already told you when measuring the Stromberg float level, don't do it near the edge because of the meniscus and the rise it there. Uh, I've already told you not to use shop air to test floats because that is a bad thing. Um, all right, this is important though. Any, any leakage, any leakage of air. Past gaskets, throttle bushings, um, and the like will be most noticeable at idle. And the reason why is because that is when you have the maximum amount of vacuum created in the intake manifold. And that's when you have the most stress against all of those components. And so if you have any leak at that point, it's really going to leak. And because of the extra leaking, it is going to make it really go lean. Like one, of the, one of the tricks that, that I know car, I've heard car guys used to do back in the day is they would use ether. And if they thought they would have an intake leak, they'd spray ether all over the place. And when the ether would go into a susceptible leak, the engine RPM would actually increase and say, oh yeah, it's because it sucks the air in with the volatile liquid. So. What would you notice? What would I notice here? Any leak of air pass? All right, so yeah. um, if an engine runs really bad at idle, but tends to smooth out, most, the first thing I think of is a, a gasket air leak. Oh, okay. That's my first thing. 
they do not run well at idle or may not even run at all. You know, if somebody says, hey, um, I've, got, I've got an aircraft that only runs uh, at 1,000 RPM or higher. Say, okay, you got, a, you got an idle circuit problem. So either you got a blocked idle passage or you got a massive air leak. Chances are it's a massive air leak. Uh, MJ, what did you write? Ye, he's writing in old English. Ye called fuel enrichment test, I think. I don't know what that is. No, because you said that like in the old car thing where you oh. put ether. Yeah. Yeah, they still do that. Do they? Okay. I uh, did that to my engine. Installation, which some of you have already started to do on your project. Number one. Use new gaskets, uh, lab is exempted from that. So, um, so, but when I put it, one on the field, always gonna use a new gasket. So most gaskets, most gaskets have the same bolt pattern. but different cutout diameters, but different. Cutout diameters. So you have to be careful. And what I'm talking about is if, if I had a gasket, carburetor gasket would look something like this. There's for the bolts. And then it's a, a center right here. A lot of times the center is still attached, but you have to knock out the center. Well, sometimes the centers on some gaskets are a little, uh, the diameter between here and here is smaller. And some of them are way out here. I didn't leave enough room to draw that, but some of them are way out there. So let me ask you NASCAR, who's my NASCAR fan? Nobody's gonna fess up to watching shiny things go in a circle for hours and hours. That's what my wife says if I'm watching NASCAR. She goes, oh, watching shiny things going to circle, are you? So I have no NASCAR fans. Hey, I went to the races one time in Roseville. Okay. But that's about it. Well, if you get a gasket that is supposed to have the big diameter, I'll make it red, it's supposed to have the big diameter out here, and you mistakenly get the one with the small diameter, that is called a restrictor plate in NASCAR. And what that does is it restricts the air flowing through the carburetor. It was kind of hard to describe on paper, but make sure that the cutout for the carburetor inlet actually matches the size of the carburetor and you don't put a gasket that's too small. Is when there you, multiple barrel carburetors on airplanes at all? Like, you know, only, only if you, when you get into the big pressure carbs, okay. not float carbs at all. So use of the wrong gasket, use of, the wrong gasket will make a restrictor plate. I'm not a big NASCAR fan. I'm nothing against it. I just don't have time for that. But I do know that because, well, I believe they were getting too fast. And so to slow them down, what they did is they actually have these plates that go between their carburetor or fuel injector system, whatever they have, and the intake manifold. And they're all calibrated and stamped by NASCAR and they have to be an exact size. And they make the hole smaller and smaller and smaller as the cars get faster and more powerful to keep the speeds down. So that is not what you want to do in your aircraft. Let me see, set controls properly. You guys will be adjusting these things with uh, idle mix, idle speed, but I want to talk to you about this. So stop at component should always should always contact before. the stop in the cockpit. Let me see if I can pull up the picture here. I 
All right, I got some new pictures today, thanks to Harry. If it loads off the cloud. There we go. Okay, so this is Harry's cool airplane. And now we know that this is his mixture, this is his prop, and this is his throttle. I'm not picking on anything. But does it look like this blue is touching that gray? Yeah. Okay. It probably isn't. We're going to take the benefit of the doubt and say it's not. But if it were, that is a significant problem because that means that the knob is hitting here, the stop in the cockpit. And the knob in the cockpit should never be the thing to hit first. The thing to hit first should always be the stop out at the component. So this prop, uh, the governor does have a stop on it. So when this is moved all the way forward, there should be a small amount. Uh, I usually make mine about an eighth to a quarter, no more than an eighth, about, uh, about a quarter inch. I like to see a quarter inch and obvious, and that's called cushion. So you always want to at least, I say about a quarter inch cushion here. So you push it all the way in and you say, well, this is actually going a little bit further. The reason why it could go in further is because out in, let me see, pull up the picture. Here we go. Make my mouse go around all the crap on my desk. All right. I need a bigger desk. So there's the stop right there. So this arm should be hitting that screw first. And then we have cushion out at inside the cockpit. See that picture came in just in time. So I should always contact for stopping the cockpit. Um, I think the official answer is should have one eighth to one quarter inch cushion. All right, last, last point here, I think. Yep. All right, number 10. Let's put it all together. The whole point of learning how things work is so that you can troubleshoot them appropriately. Although I do have one question, maybe two for Harry. Number one, what does oh. GA mean? Number two, is that your horn? <laughs> um, <clears throat> GA is go around for the autopilot. Oh, okay, that's that button. Okay, it's your go around autopilot button, right? Yep. Okay. Hey, here's this car. I've heat never right used here. it. Okay. Car heat. By the way, since, since we have these cool pictures, these are veneer controls. And I can tell that because it has a push button. So in order to move that, these are locked. You can grab them and it's not going to move in or out. You have to push the little button with your thumb and it'll go in and out and, and it locks. And that's nice. This one locks right here. It's a friction lock. But not only do you do that, but you can actually fine tune it by rotating it this way, it will unscrew. So you can do very fine adjustments this way. Both of those do that. Right, Harry? This one does too? Just I think. Yes, yep. Okay. Yeah, they have that vernier uh, twisting action. Yep. So I like that picture. Uh, okay, troubleshooting. Let's see. Let's, I'll give you a problem and you, this is your chance to earn some attentiveness points. All right, uh, carb leaks. On camera. Carb leaks while engine is off. Right, number one, how do I know it's leaking? Fuel coming out? Yeah, there's fuel coming out. Okay. Maybe not. Maybe I just have a gigantic blue stain like somebody broke a pen because the fuel evaporates, but the, the uh, blue stain does not. So look for blue staining. Blue staining will, will be a dead giveaway. So, all right, so I've got blue staining or maybe it's just, usually that's what it is. You come in right where the airplane's parked, you look under the airplane and you have a blue stain on the concrete. There is no fuel because it evaporated. So what could it be? Stuck float. A stuck float. Damn. Okay. Um, all right, well, I'll go with that one. Okay, stuck float. 
stuck float. What else? Could the float be set uh, too high? Nice. Float level too high. I put stuck float down here at number three because I've never seen a stuck float in aviation. It's never happened that I've seen. Uh, float level too high. Absolutely. Could happen. <laughs> number one reason. This is, this is like, what's that show? Family Feud. Yeah, you left your boost pump on all day. Number one reason is what? I said you left your boost pump on all day. Nope. It should still not leak. Could it be bad to uh, you? The only reason, and the, the reason why I did that on that program is because those are fuel injected engines. And when you leave the boost pump on and the controls are not in idle cutoff, fuel literally flows through the fuel system and is constantly injecting into the injectors the entire time. And you will absolutely destroy an engine. In fact, at some point, um, I did. I did, I think last semester, I showed you uh, a hydraulic lock from somebody who did that and it destroyed the engine. So number one reason? Um, the check valve. A stock valve? Yeah. Uh, maybe survey, uh, what, what do the judges say? We'll take it. Needle and seat leaking. If you have a Stromberg carburetor, chances are, well, let's just, re let me rephrase that. And the airplane that I flew, the Cessna 140, with, with a Stromberg carburetor, you never left the fuel on because you could never make the needle and seat not leak. They just leak. That's just what they do. And no matter how hard you try, they have a very slow leak to them and you'll always get fuel all over the place. So you turn it off. On my 150 with the Marvel Shoveler, I have only turned the fuel off four times. And that was once during each annual that I've owned it. Otherwise, I never turn the fuel off. All right, let's see. B. Mixture too lean. If you're going to make a bunch of noise cooking, you got to turn off your sound. Mixture too lean and idle. Improperly adjusted idle mixture screw. Let me think here. All right, I'm gonna give you one, two, three, four. I'm gonna say number one answer, idle mix out of adjustment. What about a bad gasket sucking in air? Bad gasket oh. sucking in air. All right, manifold leak. Manifold leak. And there are a lot of gaskets in the manifold. Could be any of them. L-E-A-K. Leak. Leak. Manifold leak. And that manifold could leak. Could be a gasket. Um, a hose. Because you actually have really big hoses that go around. Uh, coupler hoses. Um, or even uh, th throttle bushings. Um, you can also, a lot of times I've seen... Um, things chafing and wearing, and there's no excuse for this. This is just bad, bad ownership and bad, bad uh, annual inspections where like cables and stuff will rub up against a manifold and actually wear a hole right through it. All right, got two more. And float level too low, B. What's that? Float level too low. Float level too low. Oh, I got to take that one. Float, very good. Too low. Well, that means I added one now. Uh, some of these are actually nothing we've really talked about yet, so I'm going to throw it in here yet. Yeah, fuel pressure too low. Uh, that'd be a lowing aircraft. And what this about one's a clogged fuel in that screen? Oh, that was good. I was going to add this. You almost had it. Uh, what I was thinking, idle jet. Debris. Yeah, I was gonna say that the the little orifice up at the top yeah. with the throttle. Or, I like this one. Clog inlet screen. So I, I I told you that fuel tanks have a thing called a finger strainer, and I think it's called a finger strainer for two reasons. One, it's it's about the size of of uh, a finger, 
Uh, it looks just, it's long and, you know, you could put your finger there and it's a screen. And two, I think it, it's there to strain out fingers. And that's about how big a part it'll strain out. And so I'd done an annual on a guy's aircraft. It was an old Fairchild with a, with a Ranger on it. And I remember it was really late in the day and I waited till he showed up and he picked up his airplane and he, and he goes out uh, to the runway, which is right next to the shop out there. And uh, he's doing a run up and the, and the thing died. I'm like, whoa, that was, you know, really kind of weird. And so I'm like, hey, let's bring it back to the shop. Let's go through. And so I start troubleshooting it. And, and I find out that there was, it was not getting fuel, proper fuel flow. So I checked the fuel flow and it wasn't getting it, which was weird because we had no problems during the annual, no indications of anything. He had no problems when he flew it in there. And we had the, all this sudden thing. So, you know, me, uh, first thing is uh, shop air. So, um, so I disconnected the fuel hose from the carburetor and I took the fuel caps off of the wings, which, which smart, so I didn't blow up the uh, fuel tanks and uh, just back blew a little air in there. And you, it was weird. You kind of could hear it, uh, the bubbles go. And then I pulled the air nozzle off and it aimed the uh, fuel hose down and it was just like a fire hose coming out. So I don't know, he had some sort of microorganisms or something growing, something was clogging both fuel screens in both tanks. So I says, this is the bad part of the story. I'm like, you know, that's, that's not okay. We need to, we need to investigate this. We need to uh, get into your tank, see what's going on in there. What's, you know, what, what do you have? It's like, nah, it's fine now. I'll take it. <laughs> left. Nothing I can do about it. And the moral and, 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 and uh, never heard back. And I think we brought, brought the airplane in next year and it was like, nah, I never had a problem since. Uh, see, um, let's see. Mixture two. Mixture too lean at cruise or full power? They think first thing is, well, how would, it, how would somebody know that it's too lean at cruise or full power? Well, pilots get to know their airplanes pretty dang well. And a lot of times they can just come in and tell you, hey, this thing's running leaner than it used to. Well, how do you know? I know, you know, because normally my EGT is here, normally my CHT is here, and now it's acting different. So. Um, somebody once said, airplanes always whisper before they start to scream. So I never, ever, ever <laughs> discount anything. Uh, hang on, I'm going to mute you guys. It's too loud. Uh, never discount any, any intuition that a pilot has, anything that just bugs them a little bit, you know, um, investigate fully. So, all right. So what do we got here? I got a whole bunch of stuff. A lot of this is we've already talked about, so I can just kind of give you a but it's not much different than before. So manifold, manifold air leak. And we know they could be all over the place. They could be at a gasket. They could be at throttle bushings. They could be at uh, the actual manifold. Um, Lycoming has swedge tubes that go into the oil sump. It could be the swedgings come loose. Um, Lycoming or Continental has uh, hoses um, and couplers and, and all kinds of stuff. So. Um, AMC out of adjustment. What's AMC? Automatic mixture control. There we go. Uh, we already said this. Float level too low. Um, mix not set correctly. Fuel strainer clogged. Wouldn't you mo notice most of these on the ground first, though? You would hope so. Fuel pressure too low. Most of these actually, well, AMC out of adjustment, no. Manifold air leak should be worse at idle. Uh, float level too low, probably wouldn't notice. Uh, mix not set correctly. Well, if it's an idle mix, you're only going to notice it at idle anyway. And so uh, it would just be a pilot error of the mix. Fuel strainers clogged, probably not at idle because you don't need a lot of fuel. You need it up at higher RPMs. Uh, fuel pressure too low. A lot of people credit that to just the fuel pump running slower. And it's true as pumps wear, you are going to notice some uh, a, more of a drop at idle and they'll kind of pick themselves back up as they get into the upper R RPMs. 
um, an obstructed fuel line. I am an absolute nut about hoses uh, because I've seen accidents with hoses. I've seen really bad things happen with hoses. And when you see something bad happen with something that should not have happened, um, a hose should not be a cause of a problem. A hose should be uh, the solution, usually not the solution, but they should work, right? Um, you, you just put that in the back of your mind, you think, okay, I'm not gonna let that happen to me. So for example, and I think I've, I've told you guys about, uh, I think it was a, a Cherokee, some guy bought somewhere, it had been sitting out on a hanger for, in a, on, a, on the ramp out in the weather for years and years and years, you know, with these hanger queens and the guy buys it and he hired some mechanics to get this thing going. And so, you know, because it had been sitting out and hadn't run in years, they take a look at it. And, and uh, there's a lot of hoses on uh, a fuel injected engine. So they say, well, you know, well, let's change out all the hoses. So like any decent mechanic, you know, they got out the tools and started making hoses and there's nothing wrong with making hoses legally. You guys are going to learn how to do it. It's part of the curriculum. Um, it's not a bad skill to understand. So these guys made a whole bunch of hoses. And the process when you make hoses, you actually uh, have this, I don't want to get too much into this, but you, you insert a metal sleeve into the hose and the metal sleeve is very sharp. And so what, you, what ends up happening, and I talked to a, a guy who had a hose shop and he explained to me exactly what's going on. So we have a hose and this, this sharp metal object goes into the hose that is really tight to get in there. And so as you shove this sharp metal thing inside of here, sometimes it shaves off a flap of rubber. Now, if you get enough flap of a rubber, that's called a check valve and fuel will never run that way. Uh, and that's bad. You don't want a check valve in there because this rubber flops down and blocks fuel or the rubber just breaks off and it starts floating around and it's gonna to go to the next screen. So this guy in this Cherokee, he made it, I don't know how many miles, he, he, but he, he did kind of an emergency landing over at Franklin Airfield, which is down I-5 towards between um, Sacramento and, and the Loda area. So we went down there and uh, he had lost power. So lost power, first thing I did is I, I opened up the uh, um, fuel manifold uh, for the fuel injection system and there's a screen in there. It was just packed full of rubber. I absolutely packed. So I cleaned it all out, um, started up the engine and the guy said, oh yeah, no, it's making total full power right now. And you know, just almost like the last story. Okay, well, obviously you've had new hoses installed by the people who just worked on it. Obviously they're failing. This is not a good idea. Let's take off all these hoses. Let's go down to the hose shop in Sacramento and let's have some new hoses that are certified, tested and guaranteed, put back on and you're good to go. No, nah, no, nah, I'm good, man. You solved the problem. Thanks. Takes off and barely makes it to the next airport, which was only about uh, five, 10 minutes away. Well, our airport at Clarksburg barely makes it comes, you know, landing in there. And, and it was kind of like, okay, you convinced me we're going to need some new hoses because I opened up the fuel thing again and I was all packed up again. So it was kind of at that point that, you know, and then I took the hoses down to the hose shop and that's when the, um, the guy who was who had the hose shop really gave me a good lecture on, on hoses and what it really takes to be a certified hose shop, their procedures, all the things they do. And it made a believer out of me that I would never make a hose ever again the rest of my life. And I never have since that day because it's not worth it, but that's just me. So, so hose shops, just to tell you, they put it together and it's not that they don't get these little slivers, they do. But they have a procedure. Their next procedure is they take like a, a bore brushes, like for cleaning shotguns and stuff like that. And they have to ram this through um, back and forth, something like that. And they straighten them out. They sight all the way down. Then they flow test them both ways. And then they put them in, in, a, in a chamber and they pressure test them to I think 150% of their burst strength. Then they certify them. So unless you're doing that, I'm thinking, eh, I'm not going to. Again, it's one of those, is my license worth saving you a buck? No. Um, let's see, two unit crews. Let me see, we're just being redundant. And eh, we'll throw it out there just for you. Mixture to lean at full power. 
Well, I will tell you that we could say, well, same as Cruz. So everything is above, same as above. Same as above. And we'll include economizer not opening. Or I could actually say power enrichment. That'd be a better one to say, right? Power enrichment. Not opening. Not opening. Um, yeah, we got a couple more minutes. Mixture too rich at idle. Uh, let's see. Ooh, this has got a good one. So fuel pressure too high. What do you do if your fuel pressure is too high on a high wing aircraft? Lower it, lower it. Yep. Without some fuel. Lower the, lower the, lower the wings. It's not going to happen. <laughs> You gotta, you gotta fix gravity on that one. So fuel pressures means you have a, have a lowing aircraft if you're talking about a float carburetor. All right, fuel pressure, any other adjusted ideas here? Float too high. Uh, that's good, I like float too high, okay, float. Out of adjustment, idle mixture. Too high, that's what I was thinking. Um, I, I'll put this idle mix out of adjustment. It's worth noting that if somebody comes to you and says that their idle mix is out of adjustment or most of the time owners may not notice it. I would notice it because every time I run up somebody's aircraft, I would always check the idle mix. It's like, why not? I'm sitting here, got to shut it off anyway. All I have to do is pay attention to what I'm doing when I shut it off and I've done the check. So if it's out of adjustment, then you have to often wonder why is it out of adjustment? Did this just happen? And if it just happened, especially if it's too lean, you might want to start looking for why it's too lean, which usually means there's a leak somewhere. And that was the indicator. So before you just go hide the symptom, fix the problem. But this one right here, this one has gotten a lot of people. So if you're always going to remember anything, I would say, ooh, I remember this one. Not that it's on a test, but it's just one of those things that's likely to happen. It's likely to happen to you in lab. Let me tell you that. That's how it is. And it is primer line, primer, primer line open. So I promise you that uh, there's 30 of you, that's 15 groups of two. Um, at least four of the last class, this is what happened. They could not get their carburetors adjusted on the ground power unit. They were just trying and trying and just so frustrated and ready to rip their hair out. And they'd finally call me and this carburetor just doesn't work. I mean, they would take it off, put it back on and then finally just come and tell me it, it won't. It's, we have a bad carburetor. I'm like, really? Let me take a look at your carburetor. Go ahead and put it all together, put it back on, start it up and call me. I'd walk out and the primer line's wide open. And what that is, well, Harry, how come you couldn't send me a picture of your primer? That would have been nice. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, when you mentioned that, I thought, wow, I see that all the time in the checklist that just when you start your airplane, they always tell you to verify your primers in and locked. And I never really thought about the why behind it, but it makes total sense. Uh, it, it does. I'm trying to think, can I explain? How do I explain? Uh, so a primer for almost all aircraft with carburetor, it's just a big plunger. And so you've got, you know, a, a tube with, um, you know, something with little O-rings on it and, and, a, and a plunger that just comes out. And so, you know, as the pilot, you pull it way back and it draws fuel into this little chamber through, well, let me see. So it's got check valves. So you've got one right here. So this would be the inlet and we have to have a check valve. So let me see my check valve would be going this way. It's a little ball with a little spring. And so fuel can go in and then we've got to have an outlet, right? And it's going to have the same thing. So we're going to have a, a check ball um, going this way. That's my spring. So that when I draw back the plunger, fuel goes around the check ball, fills this up. And then when I push the plunger in, it blocks it from going down and forces it up to engine, right? 
but when it's all the way in, and I, and I didn't draw it quite properly, when it's all the way in, it actually blocks both of these chambers. So I can do that. So I didn't draw too bad. So when it's all the way in and locked, and because you have to have it locked, so it says in and locked, and there's a little twist lock on the outside, in and locked, it's going to block both those chambers. So fuel can't travel through there. Well, with this thing out, even the tiniest of bit, what happens is this goes to the engine. It's actually going to the intake manifold right next to where the intake valve is. So there's all that suction. So you have all that suction. It just sucks fuel right up through here and the entire time. So it becomes its own little uh, fuel injection nozzle. And so it will run nice and rich. And you will lean the heck out of it and it won't help. So you just lean the other cylinders out. You won't lean that one out. Because um, engines vary on how many primers they have. Um, you may have a four cylinder with only one engine, one cylinder primed. You may have a six cylinder with four primed or three primed or one. It's just kind of a weird thing. I don't know why they do it that way. Sometimes they're all primed, sometimes just one or two. So um, let's see, so we got that. Um, I think that's good for that, let me see. Yep, I think we've kind of covered all that. It's 520. And that actually brings us to the end of module one. So before you run off, I want to tell you what I am going to do. I am going to load uh, a test into Canvas. I'm going to take some of the questions that I'm kind of trying to formulate this in my mind yet. So I may not have a chance to do it until this weekend. I'll try and do it tomorrow. I'll try and do it so you have the weekend to do it. So uh, maybe that's what I'll do. I'll just leave it to that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some of the questions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, and I'm, I'm going to judge by your, your grumbling and groaning. What if I make them not uh, multiple choice, but some sort of short answer? And so I want you guys to be able to judge yourself and see how well you retain the information on this stuff. Because I was thinking about it and I, I uh, you know, I'll just turn off the, this, let me see. There we go. 